You know, I've sat in a lot of meetings and I haven't heard this type of presentation that comes from both the public and the private side together, almost agreeing across the board on some of the critical needs and, and preservations and conservation needs here. First, uh, we'll try again with uh, Jim Clapp and uh, recently returned from Kuwait. Uh, he still has his Kuwaiti uh, uniform on, I think. Uh, Jim is a professor out at uh, San Diego State and he uh, head, headed the public administration and urban studies program for some years and now he's doing uh, video uh, type movies. I mean, these are the good kind. Uh, uh, <laughs> I think enough said, uh, Jim. Okay, it's live. Thank you, Roy. Uh, just one correction, I did not just return from Kuwait. <laughs> I returned from Egypt, but uh, close enough to be of some concern, I think, in these, in these times. Um, I sort of had a little indication in my own mind that, uh, that when I was in Egypt that some of the things that I was looking at there, which as you know has a history 7,000 years deep, might have some relevance to um, what it was I was going to be doing when I got back here, uh, which was coming here today to talk to you and with you about an incipient new town uh, on the fringes of Chula Vista. <coughs> Those of you who have perhaps been fortunate enough to be to Egypt might know that midway up the Nile, as uh, everything is reversed uh, in Egypt, is uh, perhaps what might be the first new town that was ever developed some 3,500 years ago. Um, there's very little of it to, uh, to look at today, just the footings of some houses and the bare outlines of the plans, but this town was called Akhetaten and it was built by one of the perhaps most famous pharaohs of, uh, of Egypt, a man named Akhenaten, who was the cousin of the one that we hear about the most, who was Tutankhamun, King Tut. Uh, but he probably, as far as recorded history is concerned, built the first uh, new town. He was uh, the heretic king, the monotheist, uh, who believed in, in one god. The god was the Aten, whose name is inscribed in the name of the town and also in the name of the pharaoh. Uh, he built this town midway at a bend uh, in the Nile, midway between the two previous capitals of Upper and Lower Egypt, those being Memphis in, in uh, Lower Egypt and Thebes in Upper Egypt. And, and uh, it was to be a new capital, not only uh, cementing Upper and Lower Egypt, but also to be a new capital of his religion, which was a monotheistic religion. It never lasted longer than uh, than Akhenaten himself. Uh, he did build the town. Uh, he moved all of the governmental facilities of Egypt there, all the religious facilities, all the major tombs and everything. And then he was subsequently killed for his heretical ideas. This is not anything for Mr. Baldwin to be concerned about. <coughs> It does have uh, some instructive values uh, to this particular anecdote. Um, and that is that the best laid plans of not only mice and men, but pharaohs as well, will sometimes go awry as a result of uh, changes in characteristics uh, in the society that over which you have no control. Now, new towns, the whole idea of new towns is pretty heady stuff for anybody who is involved in planning. It certainly was for me uh, when I was in planning school. Any planning student knows that you get at one time or another in your planning education an opportunity to get a chunk of topography that is not messed up by previous land ownerships and previous building and all the kinds of things that fetter the day-to-day -day doings of planning in existing cities and you get to go at it much as I suppose the planners who are planning this particular project are, uh, are doing. You can be innovative, you can be creative, you can try all kinds of things, you can introduce monorails and mass transit and village concepts and things of that sort, and it, it really is quite wonderful. Uh, there is, however, a reality that is out there that often comes to, uh, to temper uh, many of, of these kinds of dreams. So what I'm saying here in my opening remarks is that first of all, this is a very old idea, the Newtown idea. It goes back, as I said, 
3,500 years, maybe earlier. It was subsequently employed and picked up in a variety of ways for a variety of purposes, some of them noble, some of them ignoble, uh, in all the period of urban history between Akhenaten's venture and the Baldwin Company's venture uh, today and tomorrow. It's a very, very flexible concept. Uh, it has, and I would like to, because you're going to be asked to look mostly into the future, and I don't want to do that very much, uh, but many of the previous speakers have said that you have to look into the future because this is a project that may build out over the next 30 to 50, uh, 50 years. I'd like to concentrate a little bit on the past and a little bit on the concept and a little bit on what might be historically instructive from uh, uh, from the history of new towns, not all of which I can, of course, uh, give you in any kind of detail, but there are some lessons here, and in keeping uh, with Santa Ana's dictum that we have to pay attention to history or we might, uh, we might repeat it, uh, there might be some things that I think will come to bear on the history yet to be written of the Otay Ranch uh, project. The uh, most of the history of new towns have been new towns have been built by governments, and they have been built by potentates and powerful people, popes, emperors, and so on. The Greeks had the first so-called new town policy. Uh, when their existing cities became too big and too large for the uh, the environment, the local environment to support, they dispatched uh, a bunch of residents, usually about two or three thousand residents, with a planner oftentimes with some kind of a priest or a god who performed auguries to choose the site. Um, and they created a new town, a Neapolis, they called it. They called the old city the Paleopolis, sometimes the Metropolis or Mother uh, City, a term that we still use today. Uh, these were pre-planned towns. Uh, they were all planned out in advance. Uh, the, in fact, the first planner that we know in history, a man named Hippotamus, was a, a new town planner who planned many of them, uh, many of the towns uh, throughout the Mediterranean that were spawned by the Greeks. And we still have today the city of Naples, Italy, which, of course, means Neapolis. Uh, it, was a, it was a new Greek city. Most of these governments used new towns to found new territories and to control those new, new territories by putting a residential population in them. They were very much concerned with defense. They were very much concerned with colonialization. Um, the famous ones that at one time there were supposedly as many as 34 or 35 Alexandrias around the Mediterranean. You can guess who they were named after. Um, and of course, the Romans picked up on this very same uh, theme of using new towns to found new territories. The Romans put initially put in their military camps, which are called were called castra, and we still see the name castra on many of the cities uh, today that the Romans conquered. If you see any English city that has the name Chester at the end of it, Chichester or Winchester or anything, Chester is the anglicized version of the Roman term uh, castra. And so at one time, it was a Roman camp. There are some famous cities that were new towns initially. Paris, for example, was originally a new town called Lutetia, founded by the Romans. London was originally a new town called Londinium, founded by the Romans. So who knows? Maybe one day Otay Ranch will uh, evolve into being one of the world's great cities uh, like these previous new towns. But the new towns that we know today that we talk about today are products of the modern, what we call the modern new town movement, which is really given its greatest form and, in a sense, the genesis of the modern new town idea began with a man who's, who was an inventor, a British man named Ebenezer Howard, who wrote a tract in 1898 called Garden Cities of Tomorrow, A Peaceful Path to Reform, a man who was a utopian socialist and probably who wouldn't get along very well in this particular context in which we're talking about a privately developed new town. But Howard had a very innovative idea. He wanted to decentralize major metropolitan areas. He felt that London was getting too big and other uh, uh, major metropolitan areas were getting too big. They were getting too unsightly. They were getting too unhealthy and a variety of other things were wrong with them. And so uh, Mr. Howard said, why not create brand new, free, independently standing new towns? 
But Howard's idea was a little bit different than what has come to pass in the United States in recent years. As I said, he was a utopian socialist, and he felt that the towns should be founded by socialist development corporations, and, and that all of the increased land value that was created by the people who moved to these towns should belong to the people. This is a developer's nightmare. <laughs> Howard did create two, develop, uh, two development corporations and himself developed uh, two towns about 30 kilometers north of London called Letchworth Garden City and Welland Garden City. And if you ever have the opportunity when, when you're there, you should go and see them. They are delightful, lovely towns. And he felt that they should be planned for a specific size and a specific population and a specific purpose and not larger. They should grow to that size, but they should be contained by their green belts and not become sprawling urban, huge urban conglomerations. What it really took to get the modern Newtown idea off the ground in Britain was not all the committees and all the meetings, and there were many of them uh, in the post-World War II era, but it took basically the Nazi Luftwaffe to convince the British that they ought to build new towns. It, in other words, uh, they realize that you can't put everything in one place. Uh, otherwise, it makes an excellent target. And uh, so after World War II, they created the, the famed British New Towns policy, which has been emulated by the Soviet Union, by Israel, by a number of other countries, and finally came to the United States uh, early in this country uh, in the 1930s in some projects that were built by the United States government called the Greenbelt Towns. We often hear the term Greenbelt Maryland, uh, particularly in the early days of the space program when some of the telemetry uh, for, for the space program was located in Greenbelt, uh, Maryland. But during the suburban resettlement administration of the 1930s, the government was going to build, had ambitious plans to build new towns uh, in many areas of the United States. It was really only Greenbelt and a couple of other uh, sort of uh, abbreviated versions of that idea that ever came to pass. Uh, they also built other towns, the atomic energy towns like Los Alamos and Richland, Washington and Norris, Tennessee, uh, which was built by the Tennessee Valley Authority. But generally, the new town idea did not fit with the United States. The ancient new town idea, which took powerful rulers dictatorial rulers to build, pharaohs and kings and so forth, was anathema in the United States. So also was the socialistic idea of Ebenezer Howard, not an idea that ever really took much root in the United States. What had to take root in the United States was an idea of public-private partnership, something that fit with capitalism and with other kinds of uh, American norms and ideals. That came about in the late 1960s. When large realty corporations joined up with large landowners like oil companies and the railroads and so on, and tried to put together an idea that it had been given voice by the man who built Park Forest, Illinois, Philip Selznick. And he basically, create, basically took Ebenezer Howard's idea that when people go out and they found a community, they create land value and they create markets for other kinds of things than residential. And Selznick idea, uh, Selznick's idea was to go out and acquire a large parcel of land, not as large as this 23,000 acres that we're going to be talking about today, and not only build the residential, but build the commercial, build the industrial parks, uh, and also even to, to, uh, to sell the infrastructure, uh, to sell gas and electricity. In other words, it was going to be a completely privately owned company vended uh, town. Well, it didn't all come to pass that way, but basically this, this notion that fit with the American uh, capitalistic ideas, American attitudes about, uh, about land ownership did take root with the Levitt brothers who built the Levitt towns and with, uh, uh, ultimately with Robert Simon, uh, who started Reston, Virginia, and of course Jim Rouse, who uh, started the uh, uh, Columbia, uh, Columbia, Maryland. And in the 1960s, there was a lot of uh, talk around the United States that this was the way that we were going to handle our metropolitan expansion. We were going to change from urban sprawl, and, uh, and we were going to have tightly 
uh, pre-planned integrated communities that would be able to use mass transit and would be hooked into regional mass transit networks and things of that sort. And the government, uh, the federal government got so enthused about the idea that they created a new communities program to do that. Well, it never came to pass. Uh, for a lot of reasons that may be in the question and answer period uh, we can talk about. Uh, this is a little bit of background that in, in the sense that new towns are not, uh, not necessarily a new idea, but they are an idea that continually uh, makes us very uh, feverish uh, about uh, creating innovation, uh, about solving physical planning problems, and about uh, solving uh, social planning uh, problems. But the realities uh, oftentimes are there. I'll just end my portion of this part of the remarks with uh, something else that's anecdotal about new towns. If you fly over northeastern New Jersey, uh, which is generally a mass of uh, curvilinear development as you look down out of the airplane, you'll probably see a little oasis of development there uh, that uh, looks like it's planned different, uh, differently, and it is planned differently. It was planned by Henry Wright and Clarence Stein. Uh, we don't hear very much about it today unless you're in planning school. It's called Radburn, New Jersey. And Radburn uh, was, uh, had very, very many innovative uh, planning principles. The village, uh, the, the whole village scheme that uh, Fred talked about and so forth was uh, uh, explored. Uh, uh, the neighborhood unit concept and all of that was explored and, uh, and dealt with very, very creatively in Radburn, New Jersey. But there's very, very little of Radburn, New Jersey. It's a small oasis in a sea of, of curvilinear, conventional type suburban development. And the reason for that is, is that Radburn, New Jersey opened its doors to its first residence in October of 1929. Not a very auspicious occasion to begin a new town on the, the eve of a depression. Um, one of the reasons I say that is because th that uh, all that is being done here and all that you have done is very laudable and very important, but the characteristics that ultimately affect the fates of communities that you're building and the fates of the developers and ultimately the fates of the people who are not here today, the future residents of Otay Ranch, uh, are not necessarily directed very much by these plans. These plans are very important and so on, but the, the economic conditions, the social conditions and so on that are going to dictate the fate ultimately of Otay Ranch, whether it is truly innovative, whether uh, it is going to be truly successful, whether it will even build out to uh, whatever the, the combinations of acreages are for open space and residential, are going to be set by characteristics that uh, are as far away as as perhaps uh, Kuwait. Let's hope that uh, what happened to Radburn or even what happened to Akhenaten are not auspicious uh, as far as the, uh, the origins of, of Otay Ranch. But, um, but we have to take those kinds of things to the extent that we can uh, into account. Uh, we need to continue to plan the things that we can uh, plan, and uh, I think that a very laudable job is being done so far from, wh uh, from what I have heard and I wish you continue luck in doing that and any uh, participation that I can have that might be helpful in doing that uh, this morning and this afternoon. Uh, I hope I can be helpful in that. Thank you. I'd like to introduce someone uh, who uh, was responsible for uh, starting the Otay Ranch planning process and had the vision of the new town there, and that's Pat Patek for United Enterprises. And I, Pat, uh, he's waving his hand there. Thanks very much, Pat. Our next speaker uh, panelist is Eva Lerner Lamb. Like many, uh, on, like everyone on this panel, they've uh, worked. Uh, either in California or gone to the East or uh, originated in the East and moved to California. Uh, Eva is uh, now in New Jersey. She heads her own transportation uh, company. Uh, she's a director on the uh, state's uh, transportation commission, the state of New Jersey, and uh, I think a delightful person, and we'll hear from Eva. Thank you very much, Roy. <coughs> 
Uh, I'm going to jump on the bandwagon and also commend this entire process. It's really extraordinary, especially having gone back to the East Coast from the San Diego area, where I now have a real good contrast in, um, in public policy style. Uh, I, it's the county of San Diego and the city of Chula Vista are truly in the forefront. They're at the cut.